We're hitting pause for a few weeks on airing new interviews to bring back underrated gems from our previous guests. We've compiled the best of pitching, lead generation, conversions, and customer feedback advice into four themed roundups. This second roundup in the series features six must-try lead generation tips. I'll introduce each soundbite with the name of the guest and the original episode number and title it was pulled from in case you want to go back and listen to the full conversation. The links to all referenced episodes will also be listed for you below in the show notes. Tip number one is from Linda Sadu, episode 154. Borrow the personality quiz funnel behind this $70,000 launch. Really trying to build my funnel with the person in mind that needed a quiz where we could collaborate and do it together. Now, when I created my quiz, I worked backwards from my offer. So whenever you create a quiz, you want to make sure you're leading it somewhere, right? Any type of lead magnet, the top of funnel has to communicate to the final ask. So my quiz was discover your quiz to cash strategy. Now, a few reasons why I chose that title was because I knew that I wanted to attract people who are interested in a quiz, but I also wanted to give them their own personal strategy based on their personality that where they could monetize their program. So quiz to cash. And then the reason why I use the word strategy is because even though I was really going after more people oriented people in my mind, I wanted to make sure I offset that and use the word strategy to really attract some dominant and conscientious individuals as well. So that way I kind of was able to get everybody. Okay. And so what happened was in my own story, The people who were coming in did filter out into all four different personalities. Now, that's not the case for some of my clients, people like Selena Sue and Helena Bowen, and actually you within media. The majority of your people I have found is actually that steady personality, people who just want to, you know, they want to take the stage and share their message and change this world. So typically, Selena's audience, for example, is more heart-centered folks. But not in my case. My case was it was actually evenly divided into all four personalities. But now that I divided and segmented on personality, I can communicate with these individuals in different ways. And what I have found was that most of the dominant individuals really want done for you projects. So now I have a segmented list where I can say, hey, I've got a done for you quiz availability spot open. Would you like to take it? And I've tried that in my own email where I had 22 responses to just like a nine word email that said, hey, I have a spot open. Do you want to take it? So now I can filter it and talk to that audience specifically. But when it comes to the quiz lab, I realized that all four personalities were actually buying the actual program. It's a higher ticket program. It's $3,600. And my thoughts was, well, you also have to consider where people are at in their business do some of these entrepreneurs that might be dominant have the extra money to you know pay for the higher tier of doing it for you? And if not, this is a great offer, right? So I had, when I did my launch, I had the, so the quiz was the top of funnel. I attracted it with being niche specific in the title alone. So only people who were interested in quizzes was taking it. So it's quality leads. Plus it was a personality quiz. So it was telling them how amazing they are. And I was sharing their personalized journey where they could have success with a quiz and certain things they could do to promote it. After they went through that step, they entered a welcome series where I was building my know, like, and trust factor. And in every lead magnet, you want to have a welcome series. And it's typically five emails. One to be like, here's your quiz results and share the result again. Then you want one that kind of validates them. The third email, you want to build your know, like, and trust factor, share some things about you, credibility markers. Number four is kind of closing the loop with the validation one and offering a tip to help with their pain points. And then the fifth email is to ask them to join your quiz program or join whatever course or whatever your offer is, right, at the end. Mm -hmm. And in that point, I was asking people to join my launch mechanism, which was the Nail Your Quiz Idea Challenge. So I was Mm -hmm. sending it to the challenge. And then from the three-day Nail Your Quiz Idea Challenge, I did that for three days. And then at the on the last day, I opened the doors to the quiz lab and then also offered discovery calls after that. The reason why I discovered offered discovery calls is because there's a portion of your audience, usually the steady and conscientious personalities who are a little bit more thoughtful or slower decision makers. They need more time to build your know, like, and trust factor. So having a discovery call and talking to some, somebody can really help them go from not sure to yes. 
And so I offered discovery calls for the entire week to really hold space for those individuals. And after it was all said and done, again, it was a mix of personalities. It wasn't like one group over the other. I really tend to actually attract all four personality types. But the good news is, is I have different offers that are actually specific for different personalities. So I can segment my list and offer different offers to those personalities. Tip number two is from Marisa Corcoran, episode 179. Grow your email list by 500 to 2,000 plus leads in one week with the Signature Summit. I actually pulled a quote from your Facebook group this morning. You wrote, nothing brings in quality leads faster than a summit. You can quote me on this. That's what you wrote. And so I wanted to bring that into this interview as a hot take. Now that you've tested some other things, you still stand by that statement. Nothing brings in quality leads faster than a summit. A hundred percent. So I'll tell you two reasons why. So in the signature summit system that we teach, we tell people we've done it enough times. If you follow this system, you can bring in anywhere from 500 to 2000 plus new people into your audience. So right there by doing a summit, let's say you brought in a thousand people when you did it. So now you have a thousand people in your audience. And if you think about like other ways that are organic, you know, so many of my friends, clients, people have done paid advertising. I've never done paid ads. This has all been you know, organic, but when I look organically in this short amount of time to put this together, so to bring in that kind of an influx, but even more so than the numbers. And this is what I talk about a lot. Summits are like the Disney fast pass of nurturing. It's like, because people are hearing you every day and we, we really curate, how are the interviews? How do you make sure you highlight the crap out of the speakers, you know, but also infusing yourself so that you're not just the creator. You're also an expert for people to pay attention to the recaps, everything. So by the time someone's at the end of that week, it is like they've spent so much time with you. Again, it's just that Disney fast pass of nurturing that yes, the list build portion is a huge part of it. Of course, we want to grow your audience, but the number doesn't matter. It, It does, but it doesn't matter as much because the relationship that you've built with people, it's wild that by the end, people are like, when does the Copy Confidence Society open? What happens next? Where do we go from here? And even if they don't go on to buy right at that next one, we see people come back again and again to the copy chat. So when we talk about like pricing too, Ellen, it's like people get so caught up. I can, well, there's no way of knowing like ever what is high ticket to somebody else could be, you know, a no brainer to someone else and vice versa. We'll never know. So what I love about having a signature summit is a way that I can truly provide my audience with something for free that I know can truly help them and be actionable. And then I set my prices for like what I need and knowing that I am truly supporting my community, whether they go on to be part of the society or they never buy from me. Because I always talk about like unlocking the three R's. How do you get people to remember you, rave about you and refer you? And so the Mm. summit kind of does that for you. You get this hit of numbers. You know, we've had people that, you know, one of my summit clients in her first season did about 1300. And then, like I said, my goal is to give you the model, take that and do seasons now that you have it. And then her second season brought in 2,500 people. So it's like allowing you to use it as you need it. And even if people, let's say you only get the only, but it's like, 500, 700 new people into your audience, just the buzz that comes from that. And so that's what we really try to get people focused on because there's so much intentionality that goes into it. And again, what we went back to saying, Ellen, we're really making sure that people are actually listening to the interviews. They're actually seeing the speakers. So every step of the way is with that intention. So yeah. yeah. The level of consumption, engagement, interaction, I can totally see how that is hard to rival almost in any other form. Tip number three is from Amy Porterfield, episode 182. Exclusive tell-all, Amy Porterfield analyzes her $7.5 million launch and shares detailed pre-launch strategy. The pre-launch also is a big list building opportunity. I, I failed to mention that huge list building opportunity where we want to make sure we're growing our list so that we can then get them into my webinar because all roads lead to my masterclass slash webinar, same thing. I do five of them live. They're all the same, but different times and dates. And all of that is leading to sell my course. So all of these assets I'm going to walk through, I didn't, I wasn't selling for six weeks. We were not selling anything. And that's a huge distinction in pre-launch. You are not selling anything. You're not even talking about your course. You can, but I don't even bring up my course because it's all just relationship building, engagement, and cultivating the right audience for me to then invite them on my masterclass to sell my course. Mm -hmm. So that's a good 
into. Okay. So first I had to pick out some themes that I wanted to focus on. Our themes were financial freedom, work-life flexibility, business building, um, talking about how a digital course can complement what you're already doing or start the business you don't yet have. So we were kind of clear where we wanted to go with these freebies because you were right. You hit it on the head right from the get-go. You said the pre-launch is a way to bust through all the objections before they even come up. So I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have a good idea for a digital course. We're going to address all of those during pre-launch so that they're no longer an issue when I say I've got something that is perfect for you. So the first thing we did is a quiz. I love a good quiz during a pre-launch because it casts a really wide net and people love to fill out quizzes because you learn a lot about yourself. So take two minutes to fill out my quiz. I'll tell you what it means for you and your business and what next steps you should take. So ours was called Discover Your Ambition Archetype. So basically an assessment to create your limitless life in business. And we cast a bigger net, like what kind of business do you want? What kind of life do you want? Well, let's figure out first what your archetype is for how ambitious you are. And then let's use that to figure out what kind of life and business you want. Big net cast right there. Mm -hmm. And so you cast your biggest net for your first freebie in a pre-launch because that you have a long time to nurture those people. We had six weeks once they took the quiz. So the quiz brought in over 20,000 of the leads that you had mentioned earlier. Wow. It's one of the most successful things we do. I think anybody looking to grow an email list should start a quiz. I think it's a great thing. So that's the first thing we did. Okay. Can I jump in real quick before you get to the Please. second? You jump in whenever you want. Okay. I'm just curious at this first stage when you're casting the widest net possible, Were you utilizing just promotion to your own organic Mm -hmm. audience list and social as well as ads? Or at this stage, had you already brought in affiliates to help you, you know, disseminate and amplify your quiz? Great question. So we do use affiliates. We had about a hundred affiliates and some of those affiliates will make one sale uh, of maybe top three will make a couple hundred sales. So it really runs the gamut. Right. And um, we included them right when the quiz started. We included them early on. And the reason being is that uh, they don't have to start six weeks early. That's really early for an affiliate. So they might not want to. They're doing other things in their business. But we also didn't want to gatekeep our opportunities for them to grab their audience into the conversation. Right. So uh, affiliates could play along at any point. Got it. Okay. And then if you remember... This might be, again, very granular, so it's okay if you don't. But if you do remember, between those three sources, paid ads, your own organic audience, and affiliates, what was the percentage split in terms of traffic source that drove those 20,000 leads? Oh, I wish I had. I don't have that information. <laughs> Come on. That's a hard question. I, know. I feel like I'm really putting you in the hot seat, Amy. <laughs> we, we could definitely, I'm sure we could get to that. But what I will say based on my knowledge of how my business works, the majority of the 20,000 leads would have came from number one, my list that would have been top Two would be ads. Three would be affiliates. Six weeks out is a lot to ask affiliates to get involved. Very few will get involved that early. Got so it. it's a very small number of affiliates that are bringing leads for some of the early assets we did. Okay. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Super, yeah. super interesting. All right. So you've cast this Y net. 20,000 yeah. or so leads have come in through the quiz. Then what? Yeah. Then we did a PDF that was all about list building. So about a week later, so we don't expire the first asset. We just stop talking about it and we move it, but it's out there in the world. It's mentioned on my podcast. It's still alive during the six weeks, but now we're changing focus now to start a new conversation. Maybe the quiz wasn't of interest to a lot of people that we were going after. So now we have a PDF and it's all about list building. Mm -hmm. List building is the number one objection why people don't buy Digital Course Academy. Amy, I want to create a course. I want to launch it, but I have no audience. I'm not ready to launch a course because I don't have an email list. Mm. So early on in my pre-launch, we're going to address that. It was called seven places to share your lead magnet to grow your email list with quality leads. It was all about list building and I break it down, get people started with that. So that was number two. And that brought in uh, another 20,000, just a little under what the quiz brought in about 20,000 leads as well. Wow. Okay. That is really, really interesting. So do you feel like there was – do you find that there is a crossover between 
people who opt in for the first thing and the second thing? Or do you feel like these 20,000 people were like a totally different segment that was coming in? Such a great question. There's a lot of overlap. So when you said at the beginning, Amy brought in 77,000 leads for her pre-launch, I did, but only 55,000 of those were unique, meaning there was a 20, uh, 20,000 of those were overlap where they signed up for multiple things, but 55,000 were unique. So yeah, lots of overlap. Um, but we also know that we're getting a lot of new people in because they might not have been interested in the quiz, but they want to do the list building PDF. That makes complete sense. Do you find that, and again, this may not be something you have the exact data to back up, but just based on your own gut feeling of having done so many launches, do you find that there's a correlation between when someone opts in for multiple things that they're more likely to buy versus just one? I love this question. We actually have data on this. Okay. So I'm excited. If if I have like three or four lead magnets through a pre-launch, yes. Um, the more lead magnets you download, the more likely you are to buy my course. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we have a stat that if if um, you at least download two lead magnets during my pre-launch, there's like a 30% chance that you're going to purchase over someone who bought only one. Wow. And so it was hugely eye-opening. We didn't find out about this till last year. Um, my marketing team really started to drill down like, wait a second, is there a correlation here? And if there is, let's focus on it. So we were on a mission to make sure that people were downloading more than one, a direct correlation to if they're more likely to buy. God, this is so juicy. Okay, going back. So you've brought in an additional 20,000 leads. There is some crossover with this list building yeah. PDF. What is that third freebie now? So the third one, just so everyone knows, there's five of these. So the third one is just an audio download. So you, uh, it's working better than before, redefining your unique vision of success. And this is where I think this is the first time I think we went wrong. So it's this audio telling people like uh, how I built my business and what worked and what didn't work for me to kind of encourage them to kind of understand what it might look like to build an online business. But where we went wrong is we're three assets in at this point it should have been focused on digital courses Mm. because what we found is we had so many leads. I feel like in this launch, we should have converted a little bit higher, but we started to attract people that there were three weeks in of a pre-launch and I've never even mentioned digital courses. So I don't think I was totally attracting the right audience. Mm. So our numbers probably would have been smaller if this third audio was just about like how to get started with digital courses. We Our numbers would have been smaller. This one brought in 9,700 leads, still a lot and a lot, lot less. As you get going, they're going to get smaller and smaller. Right. Um, and that's normal because again, cast are a wider net. But this audio download was good, but we could have done better. And uh, quite honestly, the next one we did was a PDF, number four. That one too, I think we missed the mark. It was called What's Your Thing? Three exercises to help you define your thing, like what you're known for, yeah. that special way in which you bring ideas to life based on your beliefs, knowledge, experience, and expertise. Great idea. Again, where are the digital courses? And this is my fault. My team came to me with the five PDFs or five assets. And I was like, these are great. I love the concept. I love that they're fresh. They're new. They were all new this time. Like we didn't rework anything. We started new, but we missed the mark. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Three was an audio download, so we wanted to change the modality. Four was a PDF again. And then five was one of my most favorite ones we did. This was a four-part private podcast. Now, kind of different because I have a podcast and it's really successful. So I asked my team, why not just put like this four-part podcast series on our podcast where we're getting a million downloads a month? Why wouldn't we want everyone to hear it? And so my team said, we want it to feel different. Doing the same thing over and over again, it's really hard to get people to uh, pay attention on a different level. And so it was called My Brutally Honest Road to Business Success and the Blueprint I Would Follow Today. And there was a lot of discussion in that about digital courses. So we finally started kind of bringing it to digital courses way too late in the game. But it was four episodes. We used Hello Audio. I think Hello Audio is a really cool tool to do a private podcast yeah. where people have to get the link and uh, that's the only way they get access to it. It's, it's a cool concept. So uh, that one had 12,500 uh, leads 
uh, opted into that. And I think it's cool because they hear my voice. They get to hear my journey a little bit more in depth. It was more storytelling. So I think that was a really good one. So those are the five assets we use. Tip number four is from Frenchie Forenzi, episode 184. 4X your revenue in one year by staying close to the money. So this podcast that you created when you left behind educational content on Instagram, that is the podcast strategy snacks that you put behind an email opt-in, right? So people have to subscribe to receive. Yep. So how does that, how do you execute that? Like what I mean by that is like what, what software are you using to deliver so that you ensure only subscribers are receiving the podcast access? Yes. So I use Hello Audio and that's basically how people get access. I think people sign up through ConvertKit and then I have a zap or something. (laughs) Some it's something happens, but those people can then listen to it on Apple Podcasts and Google and all of those places. But it does send you some sort of custom link just to make sure that it just goes to you. Now, can people share things and all that? Yeah, same is true with any like lead magnet or anything like that. But just tactically, that's how it works. And it's interesting because I mean, you have this podcast and that's one strategy, but I was also like, I'm not really going to know who's listening and I, I I wanted more information on the people who were curious and listening and all of those sorts of things. So that was kind of how I started going about that. Well, I think your decision to – I hate using the word gatekeep, but to <laughs> filter, right, to add in that extra layer of commitment essentially from the listener by having them give you their email is so smart for the type of business you have, which is, again, why I think I really resonate with how you – teach is you bring context into everything. And that's a quality that I can really appreciate because for your business model, right? Like primarily as a coach or educator, it would make sense to maybe have um, less discoverability because people having to opt in to receive access to the show, right. but your conversions on the back end are much higher for your actual paid offer. Whereas for us, we keep a podcast or our podcast free and Um, public because our goals as a media business are very different and it's all about reach versus, you know, back-end conversion. So anyways, just wanted to add the extra layer of context for anyone listening. Yeah, but it's important, right? Because what you're also saying there is like, quote unquote, close to the money because it's like, how is this in support of that end goal? Like what role is this playing? in that process and in that journey. And I think clarifying that is really important. So I feel like this would be a good time to insert your first hot take of the episode, which is this. (laughs) Podcast guesting, right, is massively powerful visibility. You're getting in front of other people's audiences that you do not own. However, I think something a lot of people don't realize about podcast hosting is Mm -hmm. when you have your own show, whether you put it as a private podcast feed like yours or a public like ours, it is actually one of the lowest discoverability content channels, just in the nature of how podcasting works in in the current you know structure. So I'm kind of curious about your hot take on this. When you decided to move your educational content away from Instagram, why move it to one of the lowest discoverability content channels? Yeah. So <laughs> a lot of reasons. So one was that I was like, I don't want to make another PDF, right? I mean, and I know <laughs> that sounds lazy. I don't know what that sounds like, but I was like, I mean, I don't want to download another PDF. I don't want to make another PDF, all of those things. I also felt like it was really about the landing page at that point, which is slightly different than looking for discoverability like in the podcast app or something like that. Um, And so those were some of the things. But then I also know, and you know this better than I do, like podcasting is a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of everything. And so I also, as I mentioned, had a really small baby at the time. And I was like, you know what? Strategy Snacks is going to be five to 10 minute episodes because that's all I have time for. But also so many people don't have time to listen to whole episodes of podcasts. And, you know, when it's a conversation and it's engaging like that, you know, like in that way, it's fun to listen to. But in terms of what I was trying to deliver, which was fun, but also just like getting to the good stuff in terms of the educational piece, I was like, it doesn't need to be longer. And so that was the other piece that was a really important um, part of that decision was because I know it takes time to grow. It takes time to build your list through lead magnets anyway. I didn't want to spend 
hours and hours a week recording content and trying to edit it and all of that. The great thing about five to 10 minutes is that editing takes less time if you need to edit because I didn't really need to edit much because less less can go wrong in five minutes than in 45 minutes. <laughs> that is a very fair point. So when you launch Strategy Snacks then, these five to 10 minute episodes like you mentioned, is this once a week? And how did you promote Strategy Snacks to get those first opt-ins? Yeah. So I decided to do it as almost a pre-launch event. So I had validated my offer the summer before, which was called Business Genius Bootcamp. And I had kind of, I think I had just done an email launch and that sort of thing. And I had gotten a group in and it was great. And so I was like, okay, I need to double down on this. And I decided to do season one, so seasonally at that point. Um, of strategy snacks. And I did two episodes a week. And I it was for I want to say it was 20 episodes. So 10 weeks from pre launch about six weeks pre launch through the launch and then a couple weeks after the launch. Um, and they were all solo episodes. So that was kind of the, the first piece. In terms of converting people, I shared it a lot on Instagram, because that's where my audience had been and all of that. Um, I also asked business friends who I had made at the time just to share with their audiences too and if they would be up for that. And I am a big proponent of just asking friends. Like I love to share people's stuff. I ask people to share my stuff. Sometimes you get a yes. Sometimes you get a no. It's never personal. And it that really helped to start build up some building up some of that momentum. I think that it also re-energized some of my existing Instagram audience because it was like a different way to get some of the stuff that they had been getting. And those who were already actively following it, they were like, well, I still want more of that, so I should go download it. Absolutely. And it's so convenient. I think that's the thing that I love most about being a podcast listener is unlike content on social that can get just so lost in the feed, even if you save it, like how many of us really go back to our save posts and actually look through those, right? Having something in a sequential order in a podcast feed and knowing exactly what episodes you've played and which ones you haven't listened to and being able to take that with you on the go, distraction-free when your eyes can't be like sitting and watching something, I think is massively, you know, understated in terms of the value of the experience. So you did this, you launched Strategy Snacks, and then that quickly grew your list by, you know, 80%. And from that increase in audience momentum, you then did your next thing in your decision tracking process to stay close to the money. So what was that? Well, so the 80% growth then led me, so then I led into my launch for Business Genius Bootcamp where I had double enrollment from the first time around. So that was already massive. And as I saw that that kind of you know, dynamic was working, right? Strategy snacks into business news bootcamp. I was like, well, now strategy snacks needs to get in front of more people. Like, how do I get in front of more people? And so as I was planning out the following launch, I decided to bring in guests to strategy snacks. And I decided that by bringing, I mean, my hypothesis, which was kind of an educated guess, right? Was if I bring in more guests, they will share, I'll ask them to share with their audiences. And then that will help to bring more people into this program and then more people into the boot camp and so on and so forth. So that's exactly what I did. Tip number five is from Zafira Rajan, episode 203, driving revenue with unpaid speaking engagements, $45,000 case study. I want to get into when you were actually delivering this keynote virtual, right? I'm assuming for this event in 2020. Did you have the opportunity to share your freebie during the live presentation? So in a way, almost like pitching from stage, or was it something that was a follow-up resource sent to the registrants? It was something I was able to do right at the end. And I knew everybody would want the slides because I, you know, I was talking about sales pages. I was doing live makeovers of copy Ooh. on the slides, like parts of your sales page without personality, how I would add personality in. And I knew when people were watching it, like everyone was like, oh, like my pen is like on fire. I'm just taking so many <laughs> notes. And I had to just keep mentioning, like, I'll give you an opportunity to give you the slides at the end. And then I did. So immediately everybody started opting into it. So yeah, I was able to do that from the stage, which I'm very grateful for. Okay. So smart. I definitely want you all to pay attention if this is something you haven't done before, because Zafira and I, I think are on the same page here. That is our number one opt-in when we're 
for lack of a better word, selling from stage. You're not really selling anything per se, but you're selling an opportunity to connect further, right? And we have found that offering the slide deck is one of the most appealing options because to your point, no matter how fast people are taking notes, they're bound to miss something and it's just easier to be able to refer back to the original source. So I love that. Did you give them a QR code? Was it having them text a number? Did you just type a link out on the deck? Like what do you find is the best way to get people to easily opt in? It was just a link on the deck and Amy's team had it as well. So there was a live chat on the side of it, obviously, which was like going wild at the end and they just kept putting it in. And so it was really easy for everyone to access. And I made the URL super simple. So they were able to get to it. Amazing. Okay. So this brings us to our first data point that Zafira has offered us so graciously. So this first conversion point for the speaking freebie, actually real quick before I, I know I just teased it, but like before I just share the numbers, was there any other component to the freebie besides the slide deck? I just want to make sure we're clear on that. I believe it was just a slide deck, which okay. was like almost 60 slides. Like it was very juicy. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Perfect. I just wanted to be sure that I didn't miss anything. So the numbers for that it was a 41% conversion rate, 1,393 people visited the page. So almost 1,400 page views. And then of those people, 576 people opted in. In other words, gave their email in order to receive these slides from Zafira. So that's a 41% conversion, which is great for any sort of you know freebie lead magnet opt-in page. But here's where it really got juicy. It wasn't just in the moment that they opted in for this free resource. It was directly being led to a tripwire at the moment or after the moment, I should say, of opt-in. So real quick, Safira, can you define what a tripwire is, what your tripwire was, and why you chose this strategy? Yes. So a tripwire is a paid opportunity that you serve up your audience immediately upon opting into a free offer. And usually it's really low cost, typically under $50, and is really aligned with what the freebie was. So in my case, it was an $11 product called the Sales Page Personality Kit. And for context, my talk was about how to add more personality to your sales page, right? So everybody already learned a lot in the slide deck, in my presentation. And what I was giving them was actual swipes from these high converting sales pages where they could see everything that I did and a whole workbook where I broke down each piece of those sales pages and exactly where I put in personality. And it was just $11. So it was a no brainer. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So something really smart I want to pull out from what you just said. You made sure that the tripwire was directly related to not only the freebie, but the actual speaking topic. And if you hear what Zafira just said, she said swipes, right? So really thinking about if you're going to implement a similar strategy, thinking about how do you accelerate the path to the result that they want, which in this case was infusing personality into their sales page, with templates and ready-made assets that they can apply immediately. Because as we all know, the easy part is learning, the difficult part is implementation. So oftentimes, and I'm sure we've all felt this before, attending any sort of virtual summit or going to an in-person conference, we're so hyped up learning and being inspired by all these amazing ideas, but then we go home and often either sit in overwhelm or we do absolutely nothing with the ideas because we don't know where to start. Whereas if you give them the direct tools and access to do something immediately with what they learn from the slides, and it's not just theory, but actual practice, their success rates are so much higher and they're going to come back for more. So I love, love, love this strategy. And our final tip, number six from Jesse Beyer, episode 98, how you can get on a best-selling book list as a self-published author, even if you have a small audience. I do want to take a second to dive also deeper into this concept of how your business grew from your book. I know you already touched on it a little bit. Speaking engagements was one of the ways you 10 X your revenue from just being able to add that into your pitch and doing those bundle book sales. But what are some other ways, like for people who maybe don't have a desire to be a speaker or maybe just run a less coaching type of business, what are some ways that they can utilize a book to 
fuel their business growth? Definitely. So the first thing and kind of the most straightforward thing is using your ebook as lead generation, as a freebie that you can give away. Cause think about this, for example, no offense to anyone out there who has a checklist as a freebie, but if you get a checklist versus this full published best-selling ebook for free, which right. is going to be more enticing. So you can really build your email list quickly and with high quality leads or cheap leads. If you're doing paid advertising by using your ebook as that opt-in. The other thing you can do is you can do what's called a free plus shipping funnel. So basically, yes. yeah, there we go. Yep. Okay. So with your paperback book, and this is fun if you do it with signed copies too, because everyone loves signed Ooh, copies. Yes. Um, so you do a free plus shipping funnel where the book is free, but they just pay for shipping and that covers your printing costs for the book as well. And that can be a small revenue generator. But what's really cool about that is then you're getting very cheap people who are already used to buying from you because they bought your book, they put in their credit card. Mm -hmm. And then you can take them through an ethical marketing funnel of a few upsells into a course or a coaching program or things like that from that. Speaking of the book as a lead gen source, when someone buys from you from Amazon and they get that on-demand print book, do you actually get their email from Amazon or is it anonymous? Like that data is anonymous to you. That data is anonymous. So they are customers okay. of Amazon. You don't get their address, their name, their email, anything like that. Okay. But one thing that I would encourage everyone to do is in the beginning of their book and then the end of their book, include some sort of free opt-in. Mm -hmm. If you're a fiction author, this could be a bonus chapter or a chapter from another character's point of view, something like that. If you're a nonfiction author, or I guess fiction as well, but you could do the audiobook version for free. You could do, again, a bonus chapter. You could do a free training, something that when people do buy your book, they love your book, then they can go join your email list and get even more value. What I don't recommend doing that some people teach, and this drives me crazy, is every chapter needs to have a free training associated with it and put all these links to freebies throughout your book. And it's like, you're writing a book, you're becoming an author. This is not just a tool that you're putting out into the world. Like this is a piece of yourself. And right. so I don't recommend just shoving as many links as possible into your book, but one at the beginning, one at the end, that way you can get a few email subscribers from book purchases where you don't get access to customer data. If today's roundup was helpful, will you do me a solid by giving giving us a five-star rating wherever you're listening to this right now. On Spotify, it's toward the top of our show page. And on Apple, scroll to the bottom of our show page. All it takes is one click to rate our show five stars. You don't even have to write a review. We appreciate it so, so much. Wishing you all an influx of leads in your business this week. And I'll meet you back here on Monday for our next Roundup episode all about increasing your conversions.